I'm Robbie Thigpen, and welcome to the Sargassum Podcast. I'm Jenna Contuccio. And I'm Francesca Elmer, and we are your hosts for today. We are going to share with you the latest ideas and concepts about Sargassum and Sargassum beaching events, which have become an international challenge. Let's get ready to learn together. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Sargassum Podcast, um, brought to you today by the... Uh, uh, Florida International University, uh, LACC, and I'm re- really happy for their support in this here. And uh, anyway, hadn't talked to you in a while, and uh, we're glad to be back. Francisca, you just got back from uh, somewhere in the Eastern Caribbean, hanging around some islands over there. Tell us about that. Yeah, um, as my job from Seafields brought me to St. Vincent, and I spent six weeks there and four weeks with the team. And we were building a barrier um, for sargassum that is free floating. So that floats in the middle of the ocean to keep sargassum in. And we didn't only build it, we also tested it. And we had some good testing. Not everything about it worked perfectly. So we're going to go back later on and test another model. But yeah, it was really, really cool. St. Vincent is an amazing island. You all should go visit. The people are friendly beyond friendly and helpful beyond helpful. Uh, Really, really welcoming to anybody. And we had a really good time. Well, excellent. I'm very happy to hear that. And I wish you the utmost success. Your, Your life must be horrible having to go hang out at the beach and play in the sea all the time. But, you know, um, we got somebody else with us today that's from one of the island nations, from St. Lucia. And uh, we got Beth, Beth, Berthia Thomas with us today. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about her? Yeah, um, Berthia Thomas is currently a PhD student at CERMES. Um, she's pursuing a PhD in natural resource management. And her research seeks to venture into the novel territory of pelagic sargassum with special emphasis on assessing community vulnerability to the sargassum influx using a participatory approach. She is using her island home, St. Lucia, as a case study and is working specifically with three rural fishing communities in Denary, Preslin and Miku. Um, She has a bachelor's degree of science in biology for the Andrews University in Michigan in the United States and a master's degree in management of tropical biodiversity from the University of the West Indies in Trinidad. And she has worked as a science and technology officer with the Department of Sustainable Development in St. Lucia for the last 10 years and currently serves as the Protected Areas Manager at the Pitons Management Area World Heritage Site. Welcome to the Sargassum Podcast, Berthia. Thank you very much, Francisca and Robbie. Uh, it is an honor to be here and to be a part of this podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's, it's an honor to have you with us today. Thank you. Um, the first question we ask all our guests um, is, what is sargassum to you? So can you tell us a bit how you relate to sargassum and what it is to you in your life? Sure. Um, well, I view sargassum from two perspectives, a negative perspective and a positive perspective. So using the negative lens, uh, St. Lucians view sargassum, including myself, view sargassum as a pelagic plague. Yes, a plague, something that has come to trouble the people, to destroy their livelihoods, to damage their property and household appliances, to reduce the uses of the beach and, you know, uh, even cause health effects and, and, and damage neighboring ecosystems like mangrove forests, the coral reefs, the seagrass beds. So that's from the negative lens. However, conversely, I also see sargassum as a beautiful opportunity. So not just a curse, but actually as a blessing. When you think of the possibilities and and, and alternative uses and the and possible job creation and, and making money, then and great avenues for research, then 
that's an alternative perspective altogether. So it can either be viewed as a pelagic plague, brown tide, or a beautiful blessing, curse or blessing, brown tide, or golden jewel. So that's how I view sargassum, twofold. Well, I, I tend to agree with you almost that, um, but I'd, I'd add that it's so much more than that at all. And uh, they just, when the conditions are, are proper instead of out of, you know, in, in this crazy flux that they're in, it's, uh, it's maybe one of the most important uh, pelagic ecosystems there is. And all, but uh, with this, you know, crazy things, it's all these nutrients and whatnot we're dumping into the sea and making this stuff go crazy. It's causing a lot of problems, and uh, and we're having to deal with the uh, the uh, the side effects of that. It'd be nice if uh, the world would join together and 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 deal with the cause instead of us having to deal with the symptoms. And also, thank you for that. Um, you. You know, I, I, I think I can speak for the, for the podcast. I'm certainly speaking for myself on this. I really like the way that you did these interviews and, you know, the voice of the people are, is very, very important to hear. And too, too often these things are ignored and all. And so I just want to thank you for that. Uh, these three aforementioned communities um, where you're doing some research, um, how are they being impacted by sargassum and what, how do the people feel about it? Sure. Okay. Um, perhaps before I can speak about the impacts of the communities, maybe I can tell you how we zeroed in on these three communities. Uh, in St. Lucia, uh, sargassum influxes are received along the east eastern coastline. And um, apart from 2018, when the entire, entire island was affected, sargassum influxes are restricted mainly to the east coastline of Saint, the eastern coastline of St. Lucia. Now, there are 11 sites that have been identified by the Ministry of Fisheries and the Ministry of Agriculture as receiving those influxes. But of course, you'd appreciate that um, any PhD research is time bound and resource bound. And so we could not assess vulnerability in all 11 sites. And so we created a matrix that allowed us to zero in on the three most adversely impacted communities. And we came up with the communities of Denry, Prale, and Miku. And these are all rural communities and they're also fishing communities. So how has sargassum affected the persons here? And I have had the privilege to speak to residents directly and interact with them uh, on a regular basis. And so I, I think I can con confidently say that most of the persons do not have a great sense of liking for sargassum. Fisher folk, to begin with, have um, suffered the greatest. For example, you have engine a boat engine damage caused by the sargassum. Now, one boat engine can cost as much as ten thousand US, and to the average boat captain, that's that's sometimes three three months of, of work, and then it takes about three to four weeks to fix the boat engine. So during this time, the fisherman is not working. Additionally, in addition to boat engine damage, you have damage to fishing gear, you have change in catch composition. So before, a lot of tuna, for example, was caught, but now you have a change in the species. So instead, we catch a lot of amber, amber jacks, which we call um, locally as kawang. Also, you have change in fish sizes. So mainly juveniles are caught as um, the fish associated with the sargassum as an essential fish habitat in a nursery. So they catch, it's easier to catch the young ones there. Then you have change in fish quantity. So let's say on a daily basis, a fisherman would catch um, 300 pounds. He probably now catches 150 pounds. And so he has to expend more time, more fishing effort, more fuel just to make the same amount of money. Now, when we speak about the community members, you can speak about things like um, damage to their household appliances, like their refrigerators, their stoves, their television sets, their computers. And because those things are not um, insured, they don't have homeowners insurance or property insurance, then they have to expend the money to replace them. The sargassum um, corrodes coins, it corrodes jewelry and iron gates and galvanized roofs and 
And so it has caused a lot of um, economic problems for the people, uh, health problems as well, because uh, while there is, we were not able to directly say that these health implications came as a result of sargassum, we certainly can establish some sort of correlation. So you see a rise in headaches and, and people feel na- nauseous and um, um, problems sleeping at night. Of course, when persons come into contact with sargassum rich waters, they get rashes on their skin and air infections as well. So health implications. Of course, you also have for the small island state, people enjoy going to the beach on a weekend. They take their family, picnic, play, but we can no longer do that. It's it's aesthetically unpleasing. It, it stinks. Um, it hardens. It, it I mean, it's just on site and it's not a place you want to associate with anymore. So apart from loss of the recreational use of the beach and the economic use of the beach, we even have um, uh, the religious loss of the beach. And let me explain. A lot of uh, islanders are... Uh, belong to various Christian faiths. And so you have the ritual of baptism, which takes place in the beaches. And so not even that the persons can now do. So sargassum is not something that the people appreciate. It affects them economically. It affects them socially, religiously, on a health basis. And um, yeah, it's not some, it's, it's, it's seen as a real nuisance, as something that has come to terrorize their lives and make it very unpleasant. Wow, it's a... Uh... It, it seems like it's affecting every single aspect of their life. Um, but I'd like to follow up a little something. Mm-hmm. You, you, you said that it, the fishermen were exploiting tuna, but now they're exploiting amberjacks in their place. Now, this, so you'll know, up here we call amberjacks a reef donkey. And all, because reeling them in is like reeling a mule. And all, but um, so, so the fishermen there have, have at the, is, is that because. Uh, the migrations have changed, or, or why did you? Why, why did they have to switch from one species to the other? Well, to be honest, I'm not a, a fisheries biologist, so I, I don't know exactly why the species have changed. What I do know mm-hmm. is that uh, that the amberjacks tend to be more closely associated with um, the sargassum, and so it, they're less fishing efforts. So because they're associated with it, you easily just take them up, harvest them, and they're smaller fish, they're they're cheaper, so um, they're still able to sell the vast quantities at the reduced price to make the same amount of money, because at the end of the day, it's to um, be able to feed your family. So um, if they can still make a, a sort of um, <laughs> income, if, even though it's diminished, they will still go that route. Additionally, um, Persons have now gotten a bit accustomed to the amberjacks and actually enjoy preparing them in various dishes. And so there is now, uh, I would say, a market for it now, as persons have had over the last decade to to change their um, their preferences and their choices because of what is available. Yeah, well, well, they eat good. Sorry? I said, well, they, they eat, the amberjack eat good. They're nice. Yes, yes, they taste good. And we, you have the black, black of varieties and the gray of varieties. And so you prepare them differently and we eat them. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and um, it was the same thing in Barbados. So yes. they also now catch a lot more amberjack in Barbados. Right, and so they mod- have to modify their flying fish, uh, which is actually part of the national dish. And so, yes, people have had to develop a new taste, but a new affinity for those things because of the, the changes, yes. Um, for all our listeners, you really have to go watch those videos. Uh, where Thea made a really good description of what people are talking about there, but watch her videos to really hear the local people say it in their own words because it's, it's real, they're really, really well done. Um, but in the videos, you also ask people what kind of solutions they would like to see in their community. Yes. So can you tell us a bit about what people would like to see? Yes. Um, persons would like to see, uh, number one, the government take a more active role um, in cleanup and not just leave it uh, in, in an, or, or deal with it in an ad hoc manner. They want to see uh, an established management system with uh, with, with cleanup guidelines and protocols and the supporting policy so that um, 
the goals are clear and that um, cleanup could be regularized. That's the first thing. Additionally, they, they felt that there has not been enough information sharing on sargassum. And uh, I mean, they, they, they research it here and there, but many persons are ill-informed about sargassum. And so they wouldn't mind a little capacity building, a little training uh, on, on how to handle it and what can be done. Uh, they welcome that as well. A few persons spoke to research. You know, they may be interested in developing some something from sargassum, but they're not sure of where to go to. And so establishing like your industry academia partnerships would allow persons to have an avenue to take their ideas and to know where to run with it. And of course, like everyone else, they continue to lament the lack of finances uh, for for um, micro, small, and uh, medium enterprises. I may have an idea and I may want to start up, but I don't have the finances to do so. What are the avenues that you're going to provide uh, to me to make this better? And of course, um, just the whole um, issue of, of community get togetherness. You have persons thinking that, you know what, there's nothing we can do about Sagasam. Let's just um, accept it. And others say, no, let's take a more active role. And you have still those who say, well, allow the government to take that role because it's their responsibility. So it has really divided the communities in terms of how they view uh, sargassum being dealt with. So these are a few of the things they'd like to see happen. They believe, though, that um, one aversion they have to get involved in alternative uses, though, is the fact that there are times that the sargassum is very, very heavy, and other times it's it, it dwindles. And so this unpredictability causes them great concern for starting a business when the raw material fluctuates. Additionally, when you mention things about forecasting and, and predictive modeling and early warning systems, they do view it as a little, you know, beyond their capabilities. And so persons are a little hesitant with getting actively involved because they, they want it to be something sustainable. I, I totally understand that they want something sustainable yes. because there's so many times that um, some money is freed up to make a development project and it starts and then when the money is is gone, then it cannot sustain right. itself. Mm -hmm. So it is important to, you need the seed money, but then it needs to become a project that can sustain itself right. and can keep going. Yes. Um, so what do you think? I think you already went a little bit into it, but what are the biggest hurdles to implement these solutions. Right, so I touched on them briefly. I think finance is a very big hurdle. I think research uh, is another hurdle. I think policy support uh, is another hurdle. And I think sometimes um, the, the community members wanted to highlight that they don't necessarily like things to be handed there, to them. They like to have a say in what impacts their lives and their livelihoods. And sometimes they feel that um, projects are undertaken or uh, measures are implemented and it, it's not in their mind in the best interest of their community. And so they'd like to be a part of the consultation process. And they also uh, mentioned, I want to say this one cautiously, political will. They believe sometimes that um, uh, politicians and, and, and policymakers uh, have other priorities and so sometimes these rural communities suffer at the expense of um, other more pressing needs. For example, in the community of Miku, the, the fisher folk have had to create a makeshift jetty out of plastic crates when, you know, they've called on for years for a jetty to be constructed so that the fishers would not have to wade into those cold um dirty waters so very early in the morning or late at night. Additionally, the boats get stuck in the sargassum, so there's only so far they can bring it in. You know, so this, these are some of the things that I, I would highlight. Um, finance and investment, uh, research, uh, the appropriate policy, and of course, uh, political will and, and community unity. Yes, social cohesion, strong community ties, yes. Very good. Um, so 
how many people did you interview and, and what are some of the stakeholder groups that they belong to? Okay. Um, so as I mentioned, or as we mentioned, this, uh, these videos are, are uh, the output of my PhD research. And so there are a number of interviews that we conducted. Now I'm supervised by uh, Dr. Janice Cumberbatch, and she's a social scientist and an expert in stakeholder engagement. So she has really enabled me or empowered me to um, and provided sort of a very great guidance on the, this process. So we, we took a mixed methods approach. So we looked at quantitative measures that would provide the numbers and your statistics and your graphs and your charts and your maps. And we also looked at qualitative measures that would tell the story behind the numbers. So we first began with household surveys. And the household surveys, um, the numbers of each community, of course, depended on the population. So Mikun was your largest community. And so we did 263 household surveys. The second largest community was Denry. We did 211. And the smallest community was Prale. And we did, so we did 100 and and we did 100. So in total, we did about a little less than 600 household surveys. So that's just one component. Then we did uh, focus group meetings with the fisher folk. So we had our boat captains, our boat owners, our fishermen, our fish cleaners, our fish vendors, our fisheries extension officers, our the, the head of our fisheries cooperative. So it was a nice small group of about five to seven persons. And there we, we got firsthand knowledge of how they have been af affected by the sagasam, what uh, strategies, adaptive strategies they've come up with, and um, how do you evaluate the success of these strategies. And so these were nice uh, meetings. Then we met another group called Key Informant uh, key informants, and we conducted key informant interviews. Of course, this one was conducted over the telephone because of COVID. And we we met with them, and um, these were more high-level policymakers and managers, persons who are supposed to or who currently manage Sagasam. And so we wanted to get their perspective on what has been done, what they think should be done, and what, like you asked, are what are some of the things that are needed for this to be undertaken. And the final group, which is the group I think I enjoyed the most, were our community meetings where we conducted the voice of the invisible or the voice of the invis um, the voice of the voiceless. And so what this did, it means that we went to the community members and we tried to include persons who would not ordinarily be involved in Sagasa management. So your youth, your women, your disabled, your minority groups like your uh, Rastafarians and so forth. And as a result, we met with those people and we undertook a number of activities. So the second thing, what we did at the community meetings was to conduct uh, an exercise called problem and solution trees. So with the problem tree, you had sagasum influxes as the trunk of the tree, the main problem. The roots were uh, the causes of that main problem and the branches were the effects. So your cause effect relationship. And so these stakeholders, they presented uh, their problem tree. Then we took a break and we worked on the solution tree, which as the name implies, provides solutions for the problems identified. And after this was presented, we came together and we let them know that the whole aim of this is to prepare a participatory video and we'd like them to be a part of it because we really want them to tell their story. So each in each group, we selected a team leader we selected a script writer, which ended up being myself. We selected a narrator and we selected an audio visual team. We explained to persons what their uh, roles were, asked them whether they were comfortable with uh, those roles. And then we got the ball rolling. So the next week we went out into the communities. We took our still photography, we took our videos, and we'd return to a, a, a room, most times it was a school classroom, and we'd go through it to see, okay, what have we done? So let's just say on our script, we had, we needed a school. We'd say, okay, this has been done. We needed a river, okay, we've done this, or this has been recorded, this is missing, and so forth. So we went through the footage, we went through the, 
the, the photographs and we saw what was needed. When all of this was done, we took it to uh, our class consultants, and these are some experts in documentary filmmaking, and we asked them to help us with the collation. So, you know, um, we chose our song titles, how fast we want the images to appear on the screen. We, we uh, did the narration. We did the, the people we wanted to thank and all of that. So this, the stakeholders, the community members were integrally involved in, in impacting these videos. Additionally, the people, you know, they liked seeing themselves on the camera. <laughs> they liked um, saying that this was my work or this is my house or, you know, this is my community. And so that ownership really i think you can see it really came out in the videos we didn't want it to rehearse so we didn't come to people when they were dressed nicely or their house was clean we just came we said we're doing this video would you like to speak to us and so some of them were at their homes doing their opening their their, their laundry on the lines others were washing others were cooking but they were willing to speak to us especially as they saw other community members who uh they knew you would see that some of the videos are in Patwa and we have the translation at the bottom. So we were open to everyone because we really wanted this to be the voice of the people. Additionally, um, there are a number of videos and um, photos that we could not use. For one, uh, some, some of them, the quality was not the best because we were not experts and we were actually using our phone to do this. And um, we did not want to use uh, the documentary film people because we didn't want it to be a documentary produced by someone who said, OK, go film a few. We wanted it to be the work of the community members themselves. So we used a regular cell phone and um, we took it from there. A additionally, there are others we cannot use, although they were good because it would have just made the videos too long and we wanted to s them to stick to about um, 10 minutes. So. That's it in a nutshell. The, the, the purpose of the video, like I said, was to empower community people who would not ordinarily be used, uh, be part of Sargassa management to share their voice and their perspective as they are the people that live with Sargassum every day. I mean, I can come as the researcher, as a scientist with these bright ideas, but they could tell me, no, this would not work because such and such is the case. And would prefer that other method. And it, in, this empowerment now allows them to ask for accountability on the part of the politicians, on the parliamentary rep, on the, the ministers of government. And they now can, uh, together, they now have a voice for advocacy. Wow. Yeah, I mean, watching the videos, I assumed you went into people's houses and saw them and they're working and so you mm -hmm. can easily see that. But I had no clue that you actually included the community members in planning the video and making the video. Yes, and it yes. wasn't just something you and, um, you know, your team of researchers did. So I think that is extremely smart and really making sure the community owns the, the video and is happy with it. Uh, I'm, I'm in awe. Yeah, I'm like, I'm yes, happy. this is how things should be done. Of course, it may be a bit harder, but this is how things should be done. And, and you know, Francisca, you're right, because uh, on my PhD timeline, I did have um, just three months to get this over um, uh, uh, completed. But um, I mean, I could have done it that way. And um, but I don't think it would, it would have the desired effect that it has today, because this was during COVID. This was during um, hurricane in 2020. This was during um, 2021. Sorry. This was during a general election period. And so there were a number of things that could set us back. However, it took us about four to six months to reach the final product in February. And even then we had to send it out for review and editing. But I think it's something that people are proud of because they, they think of it as as their own. And you know, they they even tease me when you when you're coming back, we're not seeing you that kind of thing, because they want they, they want to be a part of the whole process. Yeah. Yes, and I mean what I've learned from living and working in, in Caribbean communities is yes, it may take a bit of extra time if you involve a bigger team and involve the local people in being part of the team but in the end you are actually saving a lot of time and getting a much better product because um, having all these people behind it is actually what you need if you're trying to do it by yourself you will have so many hurdles um, that set you back and also 
yeah, a lot of these people may wouldn't have talked to you either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so what we did when we were doing the household surveys and the Fisher folk who would tell them, you know, look out for us, we'll be coming back and we want you to be a part of that. So we try to do a lot of sensitization and something that works for us in the small islands, we do a lot of refreshments. So we have like, <laughs> um, after the meetings, we serve drink and a little, you know, some, some snacks and, and persons come. So they participate and they, they, they get a little free food in the process. So it's a nice incentive for um, participation as well. <laughs> Excellent. Our, our next question is, is pretty much who did you consult to do this? But you've already addressed that. I, you, I think you listed every stakeholder group there except the uh, fire brigade. And um, so you've been thorough in that. <laughs> By, you know, I, I, you know, and I, I, I think you, uh, I appreciate you mentioning the Rastafari because it, it sounded like you kind of did what Bob say, you know, you, you treat this problem with one, one world, one love. And I was, I appreciate that. So, um, <laughs> so our last question for the day is what was your favorite moment while conducting these interviews? Okay. Um, uh, there are several of them, but I think, uh, what stood out most for me was um, seeing the people empowered to take charge and to be a part of better Sagasa management. I, I think oftentimes as a uh, scientist, uh, as a policymaker, we tend to think that the answers reside only with us. And we tend to think that um, as the ex we are the experts. But what I learned from this whole process is that... Um, uh, what we call traditional knowledge or informal knowledge is, is, is just as integral as the scientific uh, knowledge that, that that makes up our papers and so forth. And without that, um, the marrying of the two, then you have an incomplete picture of the whole. And I, I seeing the people take charge of, of their issues and demanding change and being a part of that change, I think, was the most rewarding. Excellent, excellent. Well, you know, to, to do this, this has been a, a fascinating project that you got going on. We really appreciate you sharing that with us. But you must receive some outside funding to do this. You know, perhaps there's some other people you want to acknowledge, and uh, we'd like to hear about how you got this thing going. Sure. Yes, thank you. I, I did benefit from a research grant from UE that funded uh, this on-the-ground research in St. Lucia. Additionally, the videos were funded by the Satrac project uh, out of the University of uh, Southampton. We partner with them, UE uh, Jamaica, UE Barbados, and we have some universities out of Ghana. And so currently, the, there's a team over in Ghana, and the videos are being shown over there. Uh, the videos have been shown in, in, in the UK as well, in Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad, and the, the idea, the aim rather, is to get them out there to see what the people themselves can do. This is not just a, a procedure in Canary that we speak about. It can actually be implemented and it can actually work. And um, to encourage other community members themselves to see that they have a voice and they can be a part of the solution. Even now, I mean, some of the residents are asking me whether they, we have additional funds to let, get let this uh, be played on local television networks because they really want to address uh, arrest the attention of the, the policymakers and see that um, this is not you sitting up in your um, closed air conditioned home. This is us not being able to open our windows because the sargassum smells so bad. And um, this is our children not able to bathe and, and enjoy themselves anymore. This is us not being able to uh, undertake little our religious activities. This is us our health being affected, our economy being affected. And so um, this, this, this is our story and we got a chance to tell our story. Well, thank you so much for sharing that with us today. Um, once again, we'd like to acknowledge the uh, Florida and Nash University's Kimba Green uh, Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies and, and for supporting our project here. And uh, Bethea, we've uh, certainly enjoyed speaking with you today and uh really appreciate you and uh we uh wish you the utmost success with your research and your your collaborative collaborative research with the local yes. peoples it's this local ecological knowledge is very important i just i really applaud you for that and i and i, I you know as you're talking about Thank it you, you weren't talking about these things 
um, necessarily academically when you were talking about the people that was coming from your heart. And the other times you're talking with your mind. And um, so many times we, what we need is to, we need to be able to uh, be able to think academically, but we need to be able to speak to people's heart. And, and that's just such an important part, uh, important missing part of what's normally done. And I just, I really appreciate you for that. Thank you so much. Yes, th thank you so much, Robert. You see, as a as a pure scientist before, I, I felt a lot of the work that I had I I did did not translate to to everyday people and to to bring about change on the ground. And so this this shift to the more uh, social science aspect has allowed me to do so. So you have the academic component, but you have the the people component, and I think this is what has made this research so enjoyable. Additionally, there are sometimes I wish that they could just grant me the PhD book based on the videos, <laughs> but that is not possible. So we still have the long thesis to, to complete writing and to uh, to get. Um, defended, but I do hope that this aspect at least will um, impact someone's lives and bring about the necessary change. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm sure it will. Yes, and I really do appreciate uh, you uh, watching the videos and Francisca, you reaching out and thinking that this was important and to uh, feature me on the podcast. I feel very honored and humbled, and I'm, I'm really grateful for being here today. Yeah, I mean, if we, if we could, if we had the funds as a podcast, we would also love to go into those communities and, and talk to people straight there where they live. But unfortunately, that's not possible. So interviewing you and showcasing your videos is the next best thing we can do. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Much appreciated. You know, one thing I'd like to maybe throw in out there, if uh, if I could, before we leave here, here in just a second, is that um, you know, maybe a, maybe a couple of those folks you've known down there might be interested in being interviewed by us as well, and also maybe we maybe we can hear. Yeah, what they I say. I think that I think that would be great. Yes, we do yeah. have their uh, telephone contacts and their email addresses, so. Um, you let me know when you're ready. We'll, they have told us that we can share them freely for training. And so I think this would be another opportunity to, to speak to another set of experts. And I, I think most of the people would welcome that. Excellent. Excellent. Well, anyway, thank you for being here. Folks, we'll see you again in a couple of weeks. And uh, tell you all your friends about us and so we can just exchange this knowledge that we're learning here uh, throughout the Caribbean Basin and uh, in West Africa. Anyway, have a good day. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. So, Robbie, what did you think about the interview we just had? Well, um, you know what I think about it. She's working with the people. She's doing her, you know, her academic research, you know, uh, formally, and, and, that, and that's all good. But she's combining that with, you know, local ecological knowledge systems. So I think it's fantastic. And all because you know there, there's such a rich area of knowledge untapped knowledge that is, is too often ignored and um I, I think tapping into that is very important and it also uh, gives opportunity for the the fish folk and and whatnot to feel like they're part of the decision as opposed to people coming in and just telling them what to do i, I think it's it's absolutely wonderful how about you yes yeah, I mean, I totally agree, especially that she um, involved them in everything, including making the video and wasn't just coming in to make a video about them, but making a video with them about them. And from listening to the video and listening to her telling what, what the people were saying, to all of our listeners, go watch those videos. They're amazing. So please go and and watch those videos and hear those people. And, and there's, there, there's going to be a link here. down below. Yes, yes, there is a link down below. That was the whole point of me saying it, and then I forgot to say the link again. Um, but yeah, like listening to those people and hearing, oh, you cannot do your baptism anymore. You, you cannot sleep at night because you have to keep your windows closed um, because of the smell, or you have a really bad headache because of the smell. The students cannot stay at school or have um, 
lessons falling out because they get fidgety, they get headaches. You know, these are the stories that somehow we don't tell enough about sargassum. We always talk about, oh, it affects tourism, it affects fisheries, it affects the ecosystems. But these day-to-day effects for people who are living close to sargassum and who have to live with it the whole time, where their beach, where they have their parties, their cultural, their religious practices, it's gone. Um, you know, it, it really affects them day by day and affects all of their lives and and so many aspects of their lives. And it is not nothing. It is, as she said, a plague to these people. Yeah, well, you know, a lot of people are talking about we need to decolonize language. We need to decolonize this. We need to decolonize that. And that seems to be a really big thing that people are talking about these days, but nobody does anything about it. Um, she's doing that. You know, her project is what decolonizing science and decolonizing education and, and academia, that's what it looks like. And all. I'm just, I'm really proud we had her today. And uh, with that, we want to thank yeah. uh, FIU again for uh, their support, continued support in our project. And uh, we really appreciate them and the Kimberly Green uh, Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies and all that kind of stuff. And just really appreciate everybody. And, uh, and we'll see you again in a couple of weeks. Yes, thank you everyone for listening. And um, we bring out the new episode in about two weeks again. Thank you for tuning in today and learning with us from our guests. If you want more information about what our guests talked about today, check our show notes for links and information in our archive. And don't forget to like and share our podcast with your friends. If you enjoy our podcast, please consider supporting us financially by becoming a Patreon. For as little as a dollar per month, you can support us and get the exclusive benefit of submitting your questions for our interviewees before the interview. The Sargassum Podcast is produced by Marine Conservation Without Borders and is made possible with financial support and consideration from Seafields and the Kimberly Green Latin America and Caribbean Center, U.S. Department of Education Title VI grant. It is produced by Jose Martinez, Alex Danielli, Cleo Maradakis, Francisca Elmer, and Alois Lopez, and is hosted by Robbie Thigpen, Francisca Elmer, Jenna Cantuccio, Florence Menez, Cleo Maradakis, and Paula Diaz. We will be back in two weeks with another exciting guest. The music for the podcast is from the song Them A Pray by Drizzle, the Ron Drama, an artist from Rotan. Follow him on Spotify and YouTube for my music. But for now, this is the full song Them A Pray.